Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our Living with Dementia lecture series. And it's brought to you by uh, Emory's Cognitive Neurology Program and the Integrated Memory Care Clinic. I am Alice Cooper, one of the social workers in the Cognitive Neurology Clinic, and I am joined by my colleague, Ashley Varner, in the Cognitive Neurology Clinic, and Laura Meathers in IMCC. Today, our topic is palliative care and hospice, the differences, the benefits, and the reasons why. And we are so happy to present this topic to you today. Um, and we are bringing Miss Debbie Gunter, who holds multiple certifications, including family nurse practitioner, hospice and palliative care nurse practitioner, and medical surgical nursing. She has over 30 years of nursing experience in many different areas of practice. She is on the faculty at Emory University in the School of Medicine and School of Nursing. Ms. Gunter is also president of her own nursing consulting firm, developing and presenting multiple nursing seminars throughout the country. She designs and presents continuing education, nursing seminars in the areas of geriatrics, medical surgical, hospice and palliative care, and has been presenting nationally and internationally on these topics for over 25 years. Ms. Gunter currently serves as a nurse practitioner in the Cognitive Neurology Clinic, an integrative memory care clinic where she sees patients with the primary diagnosis of dementia. And before we present Debbie to come and speak with you, just a few housekeeping details. One, if you would like to have, uh, we're going to be stopping a hard stop at 1255 today. So if you want to ask questions, please put your questions in the, uh, it's going to be in the Q&A section. Right. And so, um, and we will be answering those questions uh, at the end uh, after Debbie's presentation. So please, please put your comments and your questions uh, immediately when you think about them. Um, again, we have this every month, and these are topics that are we feel are important to you, but also please feel free to let us know if there's anything that you really want to have discussed. And so right now, uh, it is my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, an incredible colleague, an incredible practitioner, Debbie Gunter. Well, thank you, Alice, and it's so good to be here. And I was very pleased when um, the whole team, Alice, Ashley, and Laura, um, asked if I could do um, this talk. And I'm going to share my screen with y'all so that you can see the slide presentation. Can y'all see one of you give me a heads up? Yes, we can see it. Okay. All righty. Well, as we said, write down your questions, put them in the Q&A as we go along here. So the primary focus today is, as Alice said, looking at hospice care and palliative care and really the, the reasons why. And so in order to, to talk about it, I think it's always important to, to look at how, how did we get here? Why do we need to have these conversations? Why do your providers bring up about wishes and goals? And, you know, have you had conversations with your family? Do you have any type of advanced directive? So how do we get here? Well, why we need hospice and palliative care. One, one sort of lens from an acute care perspective is that over 50% of Americans die in the hospital after spending days in an ICU just weeks before their death, okay? So when you think about that statistic, that's a very large percentage um, that maybe, maybe, there wasn't an opportunity to have those conversations about goals and wishes um, before an acute event happened. And we'll look at ways that people die to start with and why and how we've gotten here. This picture of um, 
it's a woman. You can sort of tell it's a woman in the picture, but surrounded by multiple pieces of um, equipment. She's on the ventilator, a breathing machine. She's on dialysis, a form of dialysis. She's on multiple drugs there. And maybe all of that is appropriate and consistent with uh, wishes and the disease process, but maybe it's not. And so when we look historically um, to early 1900s, late 1800s, and before, medicine's focus at that time was comfort, right? The cause of death was often infectious disease, communicable diseases, um, and, and actually accidents um, was the other big one. Um, when you look at the average life expectancy of 50 years, um, where people died uh, was at home. The caregivers involved uh, were the family and the disease or trajectory, dying trajectory, and I'm gonna show you some other pictures in just a minute, was really relatively short, right? So if you think about an infection and we didn't have antibiotics, um, or a farm accident and somebody's mangled and they bleed to death and we didn't have blood transfusion. So the dying process was often pretty, pretty short. And then if you, you know, fast forward 100 years, 120 years to where we are now and really from the 50s on, the focus has become or when we started having more options um, was to cure. Um, chronic diseases, or one or multiple ones are the most common cause of death now. Average life expectancy, mid 70s, but really we're seeing it up into the mid 80s for sure. Often nowadays, the site of death um, is an institutional death. Caregivers often are healthcare workers, so virtually strangers. And you know, this is even before COVID, but for sure this whole past year um, within the hospital setting or other institutional settings, uh, caregivers have not been able to be families, which has been devastating. And often with our chronic diseases, our dying trajectory can be pretty pretty prolonged. And uh, many of you are caring for individuals who um, are, you know, in that process of a long trajectory. So what I was just talking about, and I said you'd see some pictures in a minute, because I think it's helpful, or it is for my brain to, to have a picture. Sudden death or unexpected death, or if you think back to what I just showed in the early 1800s, um, you know, somebody is going along just fine and boom, they have um, a sudden illness, infection, car accident, um, massive stroke, massive heart attack, um, and it's a very quick part process before death. It may be hours to minutes, it could be a couple of days. In this day and age, in the year 2021, less than 10% of us are gonna die suddenly. So that's either a really good thing or maybe a really negative thing, depending on how you look at it. Um, but that is not the average mode of, of death um, versus what we saw, again, and what I was talking about earlier from injury and infection. Um, and the process and people were very comfortable with what we refer to as a natural dying, which basically our body is programmed um, to stop eating and stop drinking. As any disease progresses, as the brain can no longer tell the stomach what to do, um, uh, to absorb nutrients, the intestines shut down. And so again, back then, there weren't any IVs, there were very few medications. And um, when you think back, or if you watch old movies, often many of you I'm sure can relate to the doctor who was coming to the house, right? Would say to the family, it's time. And they would nod their head and they'd look very solemn. They would say, it's time. And the family would say, it's time. And if word spread to neighbors, it was the doctor said, it's time now. 
Now, when we look at from, say, the 50s on, as we begin to have more medical interventions, 40s um, with antibiotics, um, and then we had more hospitals, and then in the 60s, believe it or not, that's when um, um, cardiopulmonary resuscitation became um, a much more common thing. We had dialysis begin to make its appearance, ventilators making um, their appearance. And so we began to have more technology um, so that that sudden death, sudden short dying process became more prolonged. Um, so it could be that somebody is living with a terminal disease um, and they're doing pretty well, pretty well while living with um, a terminal illness. So whether that's a cancer, whether that's renal failure, whether that's Alzheimer's dementia, whether it's any chronic terminal um, progressive disease, then something happens and maybe now they have that aspiration pneumonia, maybe they have that urinary tract infection to the point where they need to go in the hospital or it's a cancer patient who develops a bowel obstruction. And so they've been pretty steady, steady, steady. And now this other event happens, lands them in the hospital and then not uncommon, we see this whole steep decline toward death. And often it's sort of hard to understand. It's hard for families to understand. Like, you know, we were doing pretty well, you know, and we'd been doing well for a couple of years. And then I don't understand how did this urinary tract infection cause this whole spiral downward? But that's a very common um, mode of death. And so, as I was saying, from the 50s on with different um, treatment modalities and uh, interventions, now we began to see a shift from people dying at home to now people dying someplace else. So I, my, my mom, who is 90 um, currently, uh, she will talk about, and throughout my growing up years, she would talk about um, you know, living with her family and was multi-generations. And she talked about one of her grandfathers uh, dying, died at home, and then he was laid out in the home. Right? People came to the house to pay their respects in the parlor where he was. And so in many ways, prior to the 50s, death and dying was really a family event and people were more used to it. I, I don't mean that it wasn't sad or anything like that, but it occurred in the context of, of the living family, if you will, to now in the mid 50s, beginning to see this shift to, oh, they're in the hospital and we don't see them as much. And maybe we don't see that process of not eating and not drinking and gradually shifting um, toward that final stage of life that we call death. Um, and so the increase in technology obviously led us to have different expectations about what was happening, which again, is awesome. Our technology, our advances, I mean, my gosh, it is amazing when you think about it and what all can be done. So I'm not knocking technology advances at all. But often because of some of that technology and because we are all uh, seemingly, and the data supports this for sure, living longer, we are living longer with chronic diseases. So different from that previous slide I showed y'all in terms of you know, living with a disease, doing pretty well, and then something else is added and it just spirals down. 
Now we begin to see this kind of up and down. Oh, we have another infection. We treat it. We have some more time. Something else happens, there's a fall. Maybe there's a hip fracture. Patient comes through it. But ultimately, what do you see? Oop. What do you see happening though with the line? It's going down. Health status, which is basically also functional status is declining. And so this could be for 10 years, 15 years. And often when we think of our different neurodegenerative diseases, this is a fairly typical pattern over years, right? So these aren't fast diseases, um, but slow. So different things that come up. And um, I'm sure some of you are probably families of, of, of patients that, that I see or patients themselves, or when families ask any of us, well, do you, is this the new normal? Is this the new stage where mom is or dad or sweetheart or, or you know, child, whoever it is? And often our answer is, I don't know if this is the new stage. Um, or I'm seeing you after hospitalization and an acute event. And I don't know how close back you're going to get to where you were. But the chances of you getting completely back up to where you started are pretty low because the body just doesn't have the reserves, right? And so when we look at all of these advances, kind of tying it back to why I started down this path was why do we have to have these conversations? Um, uh, why do we have palliative care? Why do we have hospice care? And so thinking about it from a cure point of view, we cure some previously fatal diseases, um, sometimes infections are often, but please remember people die of infections every day. Okay, so not all infections are curable, right? Our antibiotics, um, we develop resistance to them um, and we run out of antibiotics that will, because when somebody continues to get them over and over and we expose them to so many antibiotics, they eventually stop working. So people do die of infections. And I remember having, um, seeing a patient in the hospital when I was with the palliative care team um, at Emory University Hospital and seeing a, a woman in the ICU and she had had recurrent uh, pneumonias for an underlying immune uh, disease and her husband and, and she was dying and he was having such a hard time um, understanding it because he said people shouldn't die of pneumonias in this day and age. So sometimes we can cure infections, sometimes fatal diseases um, like childhood leukemia is a great example. Um, in many situations, we can uh, cure some, um, some other cancers we've made progress in, um, but recognize that the majority of diseases that people die from, like heart failure, like, emphysema, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, um, renal failure, brain failures, which are dementias, Parkinson's disease, um, any neurodegenerative disease, we don't have any cures right now. We, we are still hopeful that we will, but we don't. And so what our advances have helped us be able to do whether that's different medications, whether it's different pieces of equipment, we are able to hopefully prolong someone's life who is living with a terminal disease and not just prolong it, but hopefully help people live the best 
quality of life they can. So when somebody has, say, congestive heart failure and they have symptoms related to shortness of breath or sweat and swelling in legs and swelling in the abdomen, the drugs that we use, and we have quite a few that can help the heart beat faster. We have medicines to try to help your kidneys get rid of fluid to reduce the swelling. But none of those drugs, drugs are curing the disease. It's hopefully helping relieve the symptoms that come with them. And, and so when we look again at over 50% of, of deaths in our country happen in ICU settings in the acute care hospital, again, some of those, absolutely, that, that, was, that was what happened and that's where the care needed to be provided. Um, but a lot of times what the healthcare team, what all of us on the healthcare side struggle with is when, when do we use all of our technology or when do we not use it? Do we use it just because we can, just because it's available? Um, so in our clinics, um, cognitive as well as integrated memory care clinic, we are always trying to look at kind of what pops up in the chart that's called health maintenance. Now it's called recommendations. But for us, health maintenance, meaning, oh, it's time for your mammogram. Oh, it's time for a colonoscopy. And this is based on age, sex, what some of your problems are, oh, it's time for this, it's time for this, it's time for this. So instead of us just routinely saying, okay, let me order that, order that, order that, we have conversations to say, does having a colonoscopy, given where someone's um, disease state is and functional status, does that make sense? Is that going to enhance somebody's quality of life? So more from a, it's, a simpler um, example to use um, all the way to, do we intubate, do we put this patient on a ventilator? Is that consistent with what their wishes are? And so this correlates with the, the earlier slide in terms of the rate of ICU use increases at the end of life and it increases significantly the older someone gets and with the number of coexisting chronic illnesses. And I think a part of that increase that we've seen over the past 20 years has often been, we haven't been having conversations to talk about what does this diagnosis mean? How does this look? Um, what is the end going to look like? Um, when someone has a neurological disease and begins to have trouble, um, the brain has trouble recognizing the saliva in the mouth, right? What do I do with it? The brain has to tell all of those swallowing muscles, um, you know, to, to swallow. It's a very complicated process. So when individuals start having trouble knowing what to do with saliva, that increases the likelihood that saliva is going to go down into the lungs. You know, there's just a couple millimeter um, um, distance between my esophagus, where food and saliva goes, and my trachea, where um, uh, food and saliva is not supposed to go. And so increased risk for aspiration and pneumonias and pneumonias and pneumonias. And at some point, again, conversations, palliative care or hospice care is, you know, we don't need to continue to go to the hospital or ICU. This is a sign that we are nearing the end of someone's life. And so I just put some statistics on here, some data for those of you who might like that as well, of um, looking at as many as one in five people um, who died in the ICU, um, who died either in the ICU or shortly after having received ICU care. Um, ICU care for lung cancer patients, this was just in one particular study back um, uh, several years ago. Um, 
in the last six months of their life, ICU um, admissions and um, care for patients with lung cancer actually increased when in reality, you would sort of think that it would be decreasing as we got farther in the disease process. So we've asked patients um, and families, but we've asked patients who have serious illnesses, what, what do you want? How can the medical team help you? Um, and without a doubt, everyone says, or I shouldn't say everyone, the majority of individuals will say, I want my pain and other symptoms to be as controlled as possible, right? So if I'm short of breath, I don't wanna have to struggle to breathe till my last breath. Um, so pain and symptom control. Um, many people will say, I really don't want to have this process prolonged. Um, I, if there's any way that I, the person, the patient can have some control, I really would like that because I feel like everything is out of my control. Most of patients that we talk to um, and um, send surveys to will say, I so don't wanna be a burden on my family. Um, most people will say, or if I say, where would you like to be? Where would you like to spend your time? They will say, I wanna spend it with family, loved ones, whatever family context that is to strengthen relationships. And so when we look at the words, palliative care and hospice care, Palliative care is an approach. It is interdisciplinary care that aims to relieve suffering and improve quality of life for patients with a life-limiting, life-threatening, or serious or terminal illness and their family. So it is an approach of care, of mindset that says you are living with either a life-limiting, serious chronic illness, terminal illness. And so I and my team want to do whatever we can to help relieve suffering, which could be physical, it could be spiritual, it could be um, psychological suffering to help improve the quality of your life, whether you have 15 years to live or whether you have 15 minutes to live. And so palliative care, this mindset, this approach means that I can provide this type of care, whether you're receiving chemotherapy, whether you're going to have open heart surgery, whether you're receiving dialysis and hoping for a kidney transplant, right? My goal is to help relieve suffering, improve the quality of life regardless of what other type of medical treatment you are seeking. And so palliative care, now we're going into um, almost 30 years now, 25 years as a medical specialty. So we have a lot of research. We have a lot of evidence. Okay, this isn't just, so we think this is helpful. This is, we got some data, great data. Um, it is vigorous control of pain and other symptoms, not just pain, but shortness of breath, anxiety, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, um, any symptom, um, care that patients want at the same time as the efforts to prolong life, if that's their goal. Palliative care doesn't mean I'm giving up. It's not in place of curative or life prolonging care. And it is not the same as hospice care. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna differentiate. Oh, oh, what did I do? I think my finger twitched. Um, I'll delineate that um, as well a little bit more. So again, when we think about kind of old medicine now to current medicine, so that I begin to bring in hospice care here. The old system, much more paternalistic um, uh, system that said, we will do everything we can um, um, to um, give you whatever it is we have and we do it and we do it and we do it. And we may not talk a lot to you about really, this isn't curative, but we're doing it because you know, we think it could be helpful and then when we exhaust everything we have, because the disease is continuing to progress, right? Then often what was said to patients and families by whoever was directing their care would say, okay, 
we have run out of things um, that we can offer you. It's time to go home, get your affairs in order. And we think hospice care would be um, appropriate. So hospice care starting in the late 60s to 70s. So it was this focus on do, 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 give things, give things. And then it was this abrupt often feeling of abandonment for patients and families to say, what, what do you mean you don't have anything else to do? Go home, get my affairs in order. I hope nobody has had that experience, but it was very common. So hospice care and then death. The newer focus over 20 years to a specialty is to say, okay, you've just been diagnosed with a serious illness or a terminal illness or, you know, an acute um, sudden event. So down here on the, the bottom left-hand corner, so diagnosis, yes, if there's life prolonging therapy, boy, I want you to, to have that. Or if there's potentially curative therapy for your cancer that you're gonna get. But at the same time, we can also talk about your symptoms. We can talk about your goals. What are your wishes? What are your hopes throughout the course of the serious illness so that as life prolonging therapy options begin to diminish and there's less and less because these are not curable diseases, most of them, the, the focus, the approach has been also you as the human being, how can we help um, have this conversation? So it's not this abrupt, okay, go home, get your affairs in order, and then have a transition to um, hospice care. So that's what we've been working on the past 15 years within the majority of hospice, hospitals having palliative care specialty teams. So palliative care, to palliate means to relieve. Right, so if you have a headache and you take Tylenol and it relieves it, you just palliated your headache. Um, the old Latin word of palliative or palliate means to cover or cloak in many ways of comfort. Um, but palliative care, those of you I see in the cognitive clinic or in the integrated memory care clinic, everything we're doing is palliative right? It is trying to help focus on quality and comfort, relieve any distressing symptoms of anxiety or depression, or if there's agitation or hallucinations. Um, that's our primary approach, as well as to have conversations about does having a colonoscopy now make sense or a mammogram or whatever it is. So outpatient palliative care, hospital, what I was referring to with teams, usually consult teams, um, palliative care, and I started out as a nurse practitioner 25 years ago in the nursing home um, setting for nine years of seeing patients um, in that setting, all palliative, trying to help uh, determine and discover what's important to somebody, what are their hopes, what are their wishes, can we meet those? Um, and certainly hospice care is a way to provide palliative care. And so again, how does it help um, helping patients? Um, in different settings um, to maybe talk through uh, questions they have that they don't feel comfortable asking anybody else. Um, maybe they don't feel comfortable even talking to their family, but they need somebody kind of outside the circle to say, you know what, I'm really tired and I don't know how much longer I can do this. But they aren't going to say that to their primary provider or their family. But maybe just saying it helps provide some peace of mind. Um, tolerating medical treatments help patients. One of the big focuses of palliative care and that approach is, do you understand the choices? Because there are always choices. 
how can it help families? Hopefully, again, what you see, number one, is about choices. Trying to help support families as they are caring for your loved ones. Um, and so again, benefits and whatever form palliative care is, is hopefully really excellent communication um, with your team, maybe even other team members who might be seeing your loved one. We talked about pain and symptom management, navigating the healthcare uh, system, guidance with difficult and complex treatment choices. So maybe we're at a point where somebody is having that difficulty swallowing and having aspiration pneumonia. Maybe they're in the hospital now and the hospital team starts talking about needing to put a feeding tube in. Is that something that's consistent with, um, with what your loved one's wishes would be? Do we need to talk more about what it could mean, how it could help, how it might not help? So as I said, types of palliative care um, that can be offered in many, many settings um, to hospice care. Again, a philosophy of care um, as we're getting close about five or 10 more minutes and then I'm gonna stop for questions. Um, first um, model of hospice care started in England. Um, Dame Cicely Saunders is credited with the birth of hospice. The first hospice in uh, um, the United States, the first official hospice in New Haven, Connecticut was in 1976. And now there's probably over 4,000 hospice programs in our country. So the hospice model of care is designed for individuals who have said there isn't any further curative measures or even prolonging measures that I want to um, seek. The model um, and now the hospice benefit um, that Congress passed in the 80s, 1984, says that hospice care can be provided for six months if the disease runs its natural course. And that's why I put this in parentheses. It is offered in the last six months of someone's life. Um, Again, we aren't mind readers, we don't have a crystal ball, so we don't know exactly, but we certainly have data, we have research that shows us signs and symptoms with heart disease, lung disease, kidney disease, brain disease. If the disease runs its natural course, I as the provider would not be surprised that my patient dies. That's kind of the lens we look at. Comfort care aimed at increasing the quality of life, physical, psychological, social, spiritual care and help um, providers, provided strong emphasis on pain and that the patient and family is the primary unit of care with all different types of um, providers, physician, nurses, nurse practitioners, PAs, social workers, occupational, physical therapy, dietitians, aides, volunteers, bereavement counselor, providing durable medical equipment, supplies, medications related to the terminal diagnosis there. So the goals of hospice, are exactly the same as the goals of palliative care, right? Emphasize living, quality, honesty, hope, um, controlling symptoms, preparing patient and family for death, continued support for the family after death. Um, and so for Medicare and Medicaid, and most private insurance companies follow Medicare and Medicaid um, guidelines. Um, with just a very few exceptions. Um, and so someone has to meet the criteria for hospice care and a physician with the hospice agency certifies that based on their opinion, reviewing the data about the patient, looking at lab stuff, looking at various um, components of the medical um, record that in their opinion, this person likely has six months to live if the disease runs its normal or natural usual course. The primary caregiver is the family. 
Um, and that the patient and family has to choose that we are now at a place where we are not going to pursue further curative um, treatment options. Now, it doesn't mean somebody couldn't change their mind and say, oh, I've decided I want to start back on chemotherapy. Absolutely, they can do that, but they would um, have to come off of their hospice benefit. I just listed some of the very common hospice diagnoses and that we have criteria that the physician or nurse practitioners look at. Um, cancers, in-stage heart disease, in-stage lung, in-stage kidney, in-stage liver, um, stroke, coma states, in-stage neurological diseases, Lewy body, ALS, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, we can put a lot of diseases on this list. It is, um, when we look at the benefits, a team, it's covered by Medicare 100%. Medication supplies equipment that are related to the terminal disease are covered 100% by Medicare. Um, there are respite benefits for caregivers, ongoing support to the bereaved family. There's different types or levels of care. Home care is the most common, but there's also inpatient um, care in a facility for a short stay to try to help get a symptom under control. Respite, I mentioned, there's continuous care that can happen in somebody's home where there's 24-hour um, provision of a person, but that's only for a short period of, of time. And so, you know, this is a variety of pictures and different settings of being able to have people at home. I will tell you selfishly, I put a picture of my dad and my mom. Um, he was at home. We had a hospice care because he was dying from in-stage in renal failure. So this was actually, I think, the day before um, he died. And it was his primary goal was to be at home. And so I just want to show this picture and then we'll open it up to, to questions. When people say, what's the difference between palliative care and hospice care, right? In the United States, where we do not have socialized medicine, hospice care is basically an insurance benefit. So there is a time duration to it. Palliative care is not an insurance benefit. There's not a time de, um, determination, okay? All of hospice care is palliative in nature, right? Quality, support, symptom control, helping families. But all of palliative care is not hospice care, meaning I've seen patients for 20 years with a terminal illness. There's no limit to my being able to see them. In other countries like England, just to use that as an example, there is no hospice benefit. Hospice and palliative care is the same exact thing. But in our country, it's a financial commitment to be able to provide that team of people coming to see somebody of not just one provider, but multiple people to help support the patient and family. So palliative care is the overall sort of umbrella that embraces quote, modern medicine, everything that we do to potentially cure or prolong. And then hospice care, that last six months of someone's life. And maybe and so, we have some yeah. questions but, and we've got about 15, maybe less minutes. So would you good. mind that, a break here? That is, this is my last slide with my most favorite quote. Okay, on well, let's all, all of my team members see this quote in our um, shared room that we have, that life is not measured by the number of breaths we take, but by the moments that take our breath away. So I'm I am going to stop. Day, I like here. it. All right, stop sharing. Thank you, Debbie. That was um, really helpful um, and a lot of information condensed into um, a really short period of time. I think we could probably talk about hospice and palliative care for um, days and um, just be getting into it. So we've had a few questions that have come through the chat. Um, 
some are around um, sort of what hospice covers. So one was a question about occupational physical therapy um, and speech mentioned with hospice, but this particular hospice has said that's not a part of the benefit. Can you talk more about reasons yep. why somebody might get that or not? Yeah. Um, so the hospice benefit, the, the national hospice benefit that Congress passed back in the 80s that outlines the different services um, is there. And um, the components of that should be the same no matter which hospice company is providing services. Um, but I will say that's not reality. Um, so when it comes, say, to physical therapy, um, sometimes absolutely provide physical therapy. If, if we can get Mr. Smith to be able to transfer from the bed to a chair so that he can be at home with his sweet Mrs. Smith, who can then manage him, that's an appropriate use of physical therapy. It's a very defined goal. If somebody is bed bound and the likelihood of being able to um, uh, restore any function, that would not be an appropriate use of physical therapy. Um, so it is a very individual, individualized um, application, I would say. Um, if somebody's goal is to have physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech therapy with goals very clearly defined that are not consistent with we really just want to focus on, on uh, quality and comfort, then it's not appropriate. And maybe hospice care at that time is not the appropriate time. You know, if somebody's had a stroke and there's a, a potential that we could regain some, you know, walking or swallowing, don't start hospice care then. Let's give it what we have. But if after therapy, those goals aren't achievable and now the focus is going to be on, on um, yep, we tried that and we, it didn't, we didn't get what we wanted to see, then hospice may be appropriate. So I would not say that every hospice, you know, um, maybe approaches things quite like that. That is how it should be approached. Does this make sense? No matter what it is. In light of someone's disease, where they are in the disease process, and why do we want this? Yeah, I think that's a good point. Not all hospice companies um, that I've seen are created equally. So nope is about interviewing them to figure out um, what that, what's their philosophy and how, what's their approach. So that's another really good point. Um, this is a question about um, palliative care in the community. Some people have noticed um, that there are these programs popping up, but there's a lot of confusion about you know, some say I have to leave my PCP. Sometimes they say, oh no, you keep your PCP and you just get a nurse once a month. Um, can you provide any clarification or guidance around that? So, um, and, and good question. Um, with hospice care and the hospice benefit, nine times out of 10, we encourage um, the patient to, quote, give up their primary care provider for the hospice medical director or medical provider. And there's a lot of good reasons for implementation of the plan of care, not having to wait to get in touch with somebody in an office practice. If changes need to be made, the nurses have protocols. Home or community-based palliative care, um, you are not signing up with another primary care provider. So the majority of home palliative care programs still want um, your primary care provider to remain your provider because they aren't assuming all of the care. They are augmenting, they're an addition 
Um, so I have several patients um, in both clinics receiving home palliative care through different agencies. And they have a nurse practitioner who goes sees them once a month. And sometimes the nurse practitioner will call me and he or she and I, uh, he, she, I will talk. Um, and if there are med changes that are gonna be made, we'll usually say, well, I'll, I'll make them. I've been the one sending the medications. So communication between both, um, I think is really helpful. But with home palliative care programs, there is not a medical director that's assuming care. Um, okay, let's see. I have a question about, um, this is not something, um, the person is no longer at home, but they're interested in receiving hospice services. Can you talk more about how home is defined for hospice? Home is wherever someone lives. So hospice um, services can be offered in nursing homes, in assisted livings, in memory care units, um, in prisons, in any type of living, wherever somebody calls home, hospice care can be provided. And actually in some communities, hospice care can be provided to the homeless population. So wherever someone calls home is home hospice care. Debbie, we've gotten a request to share your slides. Is that a possibility? Sure, that's fine. Who should I send them to, Laura, you or? Um, I think if you can send it to me and Alice, that would be helpful. Okay, I will, do that. I will do that. I will do that. This is a question about um, assisted livings, um, sort of approaching the loved one and saying, I want um, the person to be on, they, the assisted living wants the person to be on hospice services and family sort of wondering um, when they would know if that's appropriate um, or it, when they should say, no, it's time to try OT, PT, things like that. Right. Um, I'll try to be politically correct. Um, <laughs> Y'all know that's difficult at times. Um, different places, facilities, or we used to sometimes see it with day programs, should not be soliciting for hospice services. That, that's an that's unethical practice. Now, having said it that way, what I would say is sometimes the people who may be caring for your loved one and seeing them on a daily basis may have a different perspective or may be seeing different things, obviously, than you know, what, what you're seeing, depending on how often you can come and they're seeing things in a different light. And so it could be that, that it is appropriate that someone may say to you, you know, we've seen this change in your husband, wife, mom, dad, whoever it is, and they're having more difficulty swallowing. They're having more difficulty, um, with, um, uh, with falls, they seem like they're just getting weaker. Often it's eating that begins to decline is one of the, the signs that I talk with my patients and families about. Um, um, that's an important, important sign. Um, I would say certainly if any of, of you are approached by someone in the facility where your loved one is, um, absolutely ask them why they think that. Are you seeing something different than, than I'm seeing? Oh, okay. Please remember, hospice care was never designed to be two days. It was never designed to be two weeks. It is a six month benefit. So if someone brings it up, don't immediately think, oh my God, do they think they're dying, you know, next week? It is, it is designed to be that support for a longer period of time. Um, so if somebody said that to me, I would just say, oh, well, let's sit down and talk. Why do you think that? Thanks, Debbie. I think we've got time for one more quick question. We've got about two minutes left. Um, but this question is, what happens if we are on a hospice service and we don't like it? How do we switch or get off? Yep. Uh, Good question. Think? Absolutely, you have the right to revoke 
hospice care. There's papers that have to be signed, but you can contact the nurse, the social worker um, that you've been dealing with with the hospice agency and revoke um, hospice care for any reason, for any reason. And you can start with another company as well. Or if you say, you know what, or the hospice may say to you, you know what, we think we need to graduate your loved one um, because they did stabilize. They are eating better. Their weight has stabilized. Um, you know, so we, they can't, a hospice agency is bound by very strict regulations. So they can't keep providing services to people who are stable, 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 stable. That's viewed as fraud by Medicare. So when they come to you and say, your loved one has stabilized, we need to release them from hospice care. Um, they're not just trying to get rid of you. Um, they, they, they have criteria they have to meet so that they stay um, in the clear. Thanks, Debbie. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. And You're welcome. Um, that was my pleasure. It is exciting always to hear you talk so passionately about something that you really um, love and are good at doing. So um, I think it was, I think everybody, um, that was conveyed to everybody who participated. Well, good. I'm happy to come uh, anytime. Thank you. We, you may be asked again. Be careful what you be careful what you offer. Um, we are our next um, dementia lecture series is going to be the second Wednesday in June, which is June 9th. Um, and I believe the topic is going to be on advanced directives and pulses. Um, oh, good. So, um, that will. Uh, go nicely with some of the things that you've talked about today, Debbie, and communicating those end of life wishes. Um, but we hope we will see some of y'all again. Have a good Wednesday um, and we'll see y'all later. Thank you. Bye.